Hi, I'm Dr. Sherry Kohlberg, and I want to share with you today about the role of physical activity in type 2 diabetes management and prevention. I do have quite a bit of knowledge in this area, both personally and professionally. My grandmother had type 2 diabetes, and I helped her when I was very young to adopt some of the lifestyle measures that would help her manage her weight and manage her diabetes. And I myself have been living with type 1 diabetes for over 50 years, and I've done many uh, of the recommendations and helped shape, shape the thoughts of where we go with recommendations for physical activity for a number of organizations, including American College of Sports Medicine position statements um, and a new consensus statement that will be coming out later this year that I'm really glad to have been a part of. So let me get started talking a little bit about this. I'm happy to answer questions at the end and uh, hopefully you will be able to email me as well if you have any additional questions later on. So what we know about the diabetes epidemic is that it is worldwide. The cases are increasing everywhere. So you can see here, the statistics are quite alarming. 463 million adults worldwide by 2045. We're expecting 700 million. You can see that's a huge increase, 51%. And in fact, areas that have lower rates of diabetes now are even half, increasing faster, and, but it's happening all around the world with uh, developing nations. Most of the people that have diabetes actually have what we now call type two. Most of those people, but not all of them are overweight or have obesity. And what we do know is that there are some, certainly some genetic predispositions towards this. There are certainly environmental factors, but both pre-diabetes, which is kind of like a, you haven't just haven't reached the glucose levels yet that would be considered to have, be type two diabetes. Um, and type two diabetes itself are associated with something we call insulin resistance. This means that the insulin that the body makes, the hormone that is normally released by the pancreas, just doesn't work the way it should in order to lower and manage blood glucose levels. We do know that insulin resistance may be preventable and it may be reversible. So let's talk about that a little bit and see how that ties in with, with diabetes. There are many different things that can contribute to insulin resistance. This is sort of a short list of them. But aging, certainly um, losing muscle mass, if you lose it over time for a variety of reasons, um, but naturally with aging, we lose some genetics and the inflammatory condition we know underlies most metabolic diseases, including type two diabetes and insulin resistance. But the ones that we can do something about are the, the later ones on this list, uh, poor diet, excess body fat, particularly when it's stored around the abdomen and physical inactivity. There have been a number of studies that have been done in, in countries around the world that have looked at how to prevent type two diabetes, particularly with lifestyle interventions, but also with certain use of certain medications. Uh, this is just sort of an overview of that on here that came from the International Diabetes Federation's uh, Diabetes Atlas. And you can see that most of them included my lifestyle modification. Some included metformin or pioglitazone or some other types of, of things. They lasted for various amounts of times. So they had various outcomes, but almost all of them have shown some improvement and some ability to prevent the onset of type two diabetes or at least delay its onset. So what is exactly involved with lifestyle modification? We know that it's multifaceted. Most of these studies have included some change in diet that enhances its healthfulness and perhaps helps manage uh, body weight or, or helps promote weight loss. Uh, almost all of them have included some elements of increased physical activity. And most of them have tried to maintain these, these changes in order to achieve a healthy lifestyle that may help prevent type 2 diabetes and even reverse type 2 diabetes or prevent and reverse prediabetes. Talking about some of the earlier trials, um, this one in China looked at uh, the people with impaired glucose tolerance, which we would now call prediabetes, um, at different clinics around the country. 
and a lifestyle intervention. What they found were that uh, over six years, diet by itself reduced the risk of onset of type 2 diabetes by 31%, exercise only 46%, the combination of the two, 42%. And uh, although I didn't list the references here, they did have a 20 year follow up and 20 year, three year follow up in which the, the risks were still much lower as they were with these other uh, lifestyle interventions here. Uh, in the Finnish diabetes prevention trial, they adopted lifestyle management goals that are similar to the US diabetes prevention program that I'll talk about shortly. And this lasted uh, 4.1 years as an average follow up and they increased their moderate to vigorous time in physical activity, uh, 0.8 hours a week. And the, the adults that met their recommendations were 44% likely to develop type two diabetes and those who did not meet those recommendations, it would have been considered sedentary. And even in their follow-up, the reduction in, in diabetes onset was still pretty significant. And they have various models here looking at both uh, moderate to vigorous uh, a leisure time physical activity during the follow-up and walking for exercise. And in all those cases, no matter what people did for physical activity, it had some benefit. Specifically in the US diabetes prevention trial, these looked at high-risk individuals, a range of ages, but mostly on the older side and a little bit overweight to obese. And they looked at an, a lifestyle intervention arm, a metformin, uh, drug medication regimen and, and doing neither. So their specific goals of the intensive lifestyle was to reduce weight by at least 7%. And this was through dietary changes as well as increased physical activity. The goal was for at least 150 minutes per week. And uh, you can see that they in the lifestyle reduced the risk by 58%, whereas metformin reduced it by 31%. And then there were follow-up studies over 10 and 15 years that lowered the risk as well. What I find interesting about these data is that we, even when you look at the change in weight, there was an initial drop-off that was pretty significant. And then over the time of the course of the study, the weight sort of drifted back up, which is so common when people actually do change their lifestyle. But you can see there was a really significant increase in lifestyle activity in that group that, that undertook that. So that shows those specific conditions. It was also interesting when you break these data out and you look at them specifically by, by age range that the people that are most likely to develop type two diabetes are older adults. So what happens specifically in those older adults is that what works best for them our lifestyle changes. This shows uh, lifestyle by itself or lifestyle versus metformin. In both cases, these are a lot more effective than in preventing type 2 diabetes onset than just adopting um, the use of a medication. Now, in younger populations, it it's, appears that metformin may be more effective, like in this, this age group here, but it is really important to keep in mind that it's not going to be the same for each age group. So how important is that weight loss aspect? When they went back and looked at these data shortly after the trial ended a few years later, they found that they concluded in the studies that weight loss was the most important factor in preventing type 2 diabetes. And they estimated that for every kilogram or 2.2 pounds that a participant lost, their diabetes risk decreased by 16%. However, since I'm an exercise physiologist, it was, it was more interesting to me to see what the actual physical activity component of that would be. And what you find when you go back and look at those data is that although lower fat intake and more physical activity predicted the weight loss, only the people who kept exercising regularly were able to keep the weight off. And that is really important because the maintenance is as key as the initial weight loss or changes that people make. So insulin action is increased by physical activity, exercise, and dietary changes. And you can accomplish this without significant weight loss, which makes it a, a more doable goal for many individuals if you don't focus just on weight loss alone. In the 10-year the, uh, follow-up to the DPP, um, 
all of the people were given access to intensive lifestyle education. So when they started out, even if they had been in the metformin or the placebo groups, they were giving, giving information about how to be uh, more physically active and how to change their lifestyle overall. And what we found in this, if you look at this last box, is that at, at 10 year follow up, the groups were all fairly similar, which seems kind of strange until you realize that, again, they all had the chance to make lifestyle changes at that point. And specifically, if you look at the older adults, those who are 60 and up in panel D on the left, you can see that those who uh, were following the lifestyle uh, arm, uh, the lifestyle changes actually had um, a lower incidence of type, type 2 diabetes. When you followed it over uh, a number of years, again, um, it still was better to have the, the, the lifestyle. And this is among all of the older adults in, in particular. At the 15 year follow up, it's still pretty similar. The lifestyle is, is still going to be better overall um, than, not, than just taking uh, metformin or so forth. Um, but again, all of them were provided with lifestyle counseling after that initial uh, DPP ended. One other thing they found is that those who actually were able to achieve a sort of a, a remission or at least normal blood glucose levels at some point during their DPPOS, the outcomes, those are the people that actually had a lower risk of developing type 2 diabetes even if they just reached it at least once during that period of time. So risk reduction was strongly associated also with the number of times that they, they were able to manage their glucose back to normal levels. And again, the, the, this is a really recent, these are really recent data that came out looking at uh, physical activity specifically. Um, it inversely related to uh, onset it with type two diabetes over the long term, even when they adjusted for things like body weight, but in particular in those who started out with a lower baseline of activity. So you can see they're all fairly similar after a certain number of years. However, when you look specifically at in all the study groups uh, combined, or even those in just the lifestyle arm, those who started out with the lowest levels of baseline physical activity gained the most by increasing their physical activity. So there was a, an overall 6% reduction in the onset um, with each, each six met hours per week of physical activity, or the equivalent of about 17 minutes of brisk walking per day over the follow-up period, but 12% or twice as much for those who started out with a low physical activity level, and which is great news because you can tell people who are currently sedentary, that one of the best things they can do to lower the risk of developing type 2 diabetes is to become physically active and to remain that way. Why does that work? Well, to me as an exercise physiologist, it makes perfect sense. We know that the muscle mass quantity and quality is impacted by things like aging, disease, and disuse. So in this picture here on the left, this is basically a CT scan cut through the thigh, so the, the bone is in the in the in the middle, um, and then this is muscle around it, and this would be adipose tissue on the outside. This is what happens with inactivity or disease states, where you get sort of a marbling of the muscle, like like steak, and you have a loss in basically quality and quantity of the muscle. And this happens uh, with, with disuse in particular, but also um, certain disease states. And, and what we found interestingly, looking at this particular study here, the insulin action stays high when we're physically active, despite the impact of aging and the potential loss of muscle mass, because then here they have uh, master athletes, uh, younger versus older athletes who are master athletes, they really found no difference in their glucose disposal as long as they're physically active. But what did make it decrease was um, being sedentary and being obese and sedentary was the worst situation. So it's kind of a progressive decline, um, not just from age alone, which is really good news. It's not like you necessarily become more insulin resistant with aging as long as you remain physically active. So that's the key. Why does it work and how does it work? Well, looking at different types of activity, 
Uh, this was a study done in, in women with type 2 diabetes and where they actually did diet and exercise uh, or, or a combination of both. They actually were able to reduce their body fat. Um, and the, but they, when looking at the, the type of body fat they were considered to be most um, abnormal in terms of causing maybe onset of metabolic diseases or type 2 diabetes, the visceral or the deep uh, abdominal fat, that was only reduced when they did diet and exercise or exercise alone. And just diet by itself didn't significantly reduce that visceral, visceral adipose tissue. That was aerobic exercise. Now looking at resistance exercise, this happened to be a training uh, in, in studying in men, 16 weeks. And what they found with these uh, men is that pre-training, post-training, they actually lost abdominal fat. They also lost visceral fat um, quite a bit even though their overall weight didn't change much. So they gained muscle, they lost the bad type of uh, abdominal fat. Their insulin sensitivity went up significantly, their fasting blood glucose decreased, and they were eating more. So this is all good news for anybody who's interested. And on the, the left, this insulin sensitivity index, I'm always at marvel when you look at uh, means versus individual here. But if you look at each individual person, this is a very small pilot study, but every single person had some increase in insulin sensitivity with the resistance training. More recently, people have looked at what happens when you lose muscle mass with dieting. We've always known that that's something you want to try to avoid. Um, but, so when you're going restricting calories, you can lose weight, but if you also lose muscle mass, you also lose potential for increased uh, carbohydrate storage. So in this study, doing either resistance training alone or combined uh, aerobic and resistance training while people are losing weight through diet changes, uh, they were able to maintain protein synthesis much more effectively than if they weren't exercising or they did aerobic by itself. So that's always important to admonish people that if they're gonna go on a calorie restricted diet, make sure to include some kind of physical activity. So when we talk about physical activity versus exercise, I just wanna say that I, I tend to use those two terms interchangeably. However, uh, think of physical activity as the umbrella, it includes all types of, of movement that increases energy use during the day. Whereas exercise is a subset of planned or structured types of physical activity. And when you get into talking about those structured ones, then you can get into talking about how to prescribe them, which we'll do a little bit more of this um, later on. Just to start out, just make sure everybody's on the same page about uh, what, what is required medically. Um, some people may need to have a medical checkup before they start exercising, it sort of depends on a number of things here, age, health, and whether they're currently sedentary or active. But most people can start with easy activities or walking without getting a checkup. Some people may need at least medical clearance, which is what the American College of Sports Medicine recommends prior to starting, particularly prior to starting a harder exercise or vigorous activity. In terms of doing an exercise uh, stress test, um, it can be done for a number of reasons, but it's generally not universally recommended to enhance exercise safety. Um, certainly you could do it to, to test someone's fitness and so forth, but in my own personal experience, um, doing research studies and having uh, an individual who actually went into cardiac arrest during uh, uh, exercise training in our laboratory, and luckily we had an AED to use to, to revive him. We had tested him with an exercise stress test before and after training and saw no evidence of heart disease, where, where, but he actually did have very significant coronary artery blockage that just wasn't apparent on the testing. So it doesn't pick it up all the time. There are a lot of false positives and it's just not uh, universally recommended. What do we need to know about how a body responds to blood glu uh, in terms of blood glucose to being physically active? In most people, moderate aerobic exercise helps lower blood glucose, which is good news. Um, and how does that happen? I think it, this is a really important slide. So we have two ways to get the blood glucose out of the, the bloodstream and into the muscles. So at rest, insulin, whether it's injected, pumped, uh, inhaled, or natural insulin in the body 
um, is going to be the main mechanism to store carbohydrates in muscle and uh, in the liver to, as well. But during exercise, insulin still can have an impact and contractions have a separate and additive impact. We know that these are from a series of studies in the late 1990s and so forth. These are additive. So the problems come just in managing diabetes if someone actually does take insulin and then a person is exercising, they have two things that can lower blood glucose during exercise, which can sometimes result in hypoglycemia. Just want to quickly go through the energy systems and why the use of these different systems can sometimes cause a different uh, blood glucose response. We have this, this really short-term energy that only lasts us for in really about 10 seconds of exercise when we start. This is just the energy currency that's stored immediately in muscle, the ATP that's immediately available or can be immediately replaced. And that is a very short term, but we'll use that for, for a very quick thing like um, throwing a ball or jumping up or something like that. The second energy system is, um, we usually call it the lactic acid system where we break down glycogen that's stored in the muscles and it provides, a, it's purely a carbohydrate source of energy. It provides energy uh, basically for 30 seconds to two minutes, usually results in some kind of um, muscle burning sensation pain. We're all familiar with this when we're waiting for our, our third energy system to kick in, which is our aerobic system here that can use a variety of fuels, fat, uh, carbohydrate, and to a less extent, set extent protein. It gives us a, a, the ability to exercise for anything that lasts longer than two to five minutes, and we're able to, to fuel it through that. Um, these are all important because if we're just using the first two energy systems, um, particularly with a very intense exercise, we may actually raise blood glucose as opposed to the usual effect of doing moderate aerobic exercise, which would see a, a lowering of blood glucose. So the reason why that those really brief and intense bouts of activity can raise blood glucose in people with diabetes and even people without diabetes is because we have this these glucose raising hormones that are actually released sort of exponentially so that not so much is released during low to moderate exercise. And when we get to intense exercise, it just shoots up and we have a, a big increase in the amount that, that is because the body wants to maintain enough glucose to be active. Sometimes the easiest thing to do is a, a, a easy cool aerobic cool down to help lower blood glucose if that happens after some type of uh, harder exercise. So kind of just talking about what's best overall in terms of uh, blood glucose management. Um, I've kind of categorized the types of activity into these four types. And if you had to, to guess, which one would you pick? I usually ask people and then I wait and I hear all sorts of answers. And the real answer is probably all of them uh, based on the research that we've seen. Each has a different kind of benefit. So aerobic exercise, we know that just doing a single bout can increase insulin action for a period of time afterwards. And it varies by the type of activity that someone does and the, basically the duration, the intensity and everything else. We know it, that that is most, it's basically an increase in insulin sensitivity that's most related to uh, greater glycogen storage replacement after exercise. Uh, basically, we're restoring the glycogen that we used, and that we're relying more on fat metabolism during that period of time. The problem is that you're only as good as your last bout of aerobic exercise. So we, we have to do this fairly frequently in order to maintain any kind of elevation in insulin action related to that. Resistance exercise and training, a single bout, if it's really intense, can actually cause blood glucose to go up. But the longer term effects are, are benefits that come from increasing or, or at least maintaining muscle mass uh, and preventing loss of muscle mass with aging or with disuse. And that gives us a bigger uh, carbohydrate storage tank, if you think of it that way, of muscles being where we store the carbohydrates that are in our, our diet. I think of all the four though, the four types, if I had to pick one as being the most critical, I would pick resistance training. That's because we do have some loss of muscle mass with aging. It just occurs um, both because of 
uh, physical inactivity in some cases or just not recruiting certain muscle fibers. Um, but it also happens uh, more rapidly with disease states, including type 2 diabetes. And as I mentioned with the dieting and wanting to exercise, you can lose it if you're trying to lose weight rapidly. And as I mentioned, that carbohydrates, carbohydrate storage tank is really critical. So you always want to have it as big as possible. So as, have as much muscle mass as you can within your genetic limitations and your time constraints, and also have it partway empty all the time. So there's always some room to put in more carbohydrate gas when the opportunity arises. Both of those are gonna really have a big impact on insulin sensitivity and how well the body is able to, to manage glucose and carbohydrates and prevent elevations. Flexibility training though is also important in its own way, um, particularly in older adults. This is one study that I was involved in that we, we actually did resistance training as well as flexibility training. And, and obviously they found improvements in strength, um, but also increase in range of motion around particular joints and it occurred more so in, in people with um, diabetes. So we know that this is important, partly because um, people with diabetes, when their blood glucose goes up, it tends to the glucose levels tend to dictate that you have greater stickiness of glucose to joint structures. So we know we have uh, binding of glucose to collagen and, and uh, cartilage and other areas of the body that reduce flexibility in those areas. And we're losing some flexibility with aging anyway. So we just can lose it even faster with diabetes, particularly if you're not doing any training. But this shows that you can make some changes with doing regular training. As far as balance training, um, we've also looked at that in, in people with type 2 diabetes. Uh, some of them had mild to moderate amounts of peripheral neuropathy, slower reaction times. Uh, they had other changes, increased postural sway. So that means they're more likely to fall. And what we found doing just simple balance training for six weeks is that we were able to re reduce the risk of falling for people with type 2 diabetes. Um, pretty significantly with very little training. So that's a good thing to know that it's important to undertake. In terms of activity breaks, that's sort of a big thing that, that people are checking now. It's kind of like uh, they're, they're studying that to find out what can we do in terms of uh, just enhancing metabolism during the course of the day. So in this study, they looked at some adults who either undertook sitting only or, or they did interspersed three minutes of light walking or three minutes of simple resistance training every 30 minutes, which they did by standing by a desk. But basically just interrupting the sitting, what they were able to do is find that starting in about the first hour when they interrupt every 30 minutes for three minutes, you'll see a decrease, those bottom two lines are both types of activity, walking and resistance training. And you see that all the way up to seven hours. And this line that's on the top here, those are the people that remain sedentary. So this is the, the, their blood glucose levels were significantly lowered by taking these activity breaks during the day. So getting back to how do we then prescribe exercise specifically for both diabetes management and diabetes prevention. Getting back to the nitty gritty then, frequency is gonna be how often someone is undertaking an activity, the intensity is how hard, uh, time can vary both uh, how long a duration, but uh, and it's not in prescription, but the exercise time of day can have a big impact. Um, and that usually should be included if, because people are gonna have different blood glucose responses to morning exercise versus afternoon exercise. But we also prescribe by type. We look at the total volume, which is frequency by times intensity times time. And that can also be measured in total calorie expenditure. And then talk more about progression, how quickly someone should move forward in these various areas in terms of frequency, intensity, and time. Um, and there, there are a lot of guidelines out there that you can find um, that will give people recommendations. Um, but just in general, now at this point in time, we don't consider that uh, what people should do for type 2 diabetes is really much different than the average adult should undertake. Um, so the federal guidelines also apply that are for all adults, um, as well as the ones that are specific to, to diabetes. 
So in terms of aerobic exercise, what is recommended is 150 and now all the way up to 300 minutes per week of moderate uh, aerobic activity. And if somebody wants to engage in vigorous, you can get by with about half the time, 75 to 150 minutes per week, or you can mix and match. You can do some moderate, some vigorous, figure out the time from there. What is really important though in people with diabetes is that aerobic exercise should be undertaken at least every other day. And again, that gets to back to the fact that you're only as good as your last bout of, of aerobic activity and the effects are only gonna last from the last bout from anywhere from two to 72 hours. Most commonly it's somewhere you know, in the first 24 hours you start to lose the effect, but you wanna be able to undertake it at least every other day. Walking at, at any speed is, Actually, the most common activity that people do with type 2 diabetes, the only concerns would be to make sure that someone has good socks that keep their feet dry and shoes that don't cause uh, undue trauma to any areas of the feet. And as you can see, there are a number of different types of aerobic activities that can be undertaken. All would be considered fairly equal and uh, not that some are much that much better than others, but they're all potential ones. So it gives people a lot of options. People can start out doing less at one time if they're very deconditioned, and we know that that can be an effective way to building up a, a fitness space. And interval training, a lot of studies have been undertaken on that uh, recently, and it can be very, very effective in adults. Intervals can consist of all sorts of things, just like walking faster between two points, uh, two mailboxes or whatever, if you're walking outside but also specific really high intensity interval training has been studied. It's just not um, gonna be for everybody to undertake because it is a little bit more difficult. And again, some people would need medical clearance or checkup of some sort before they start that. For resistance training, the, the recommendations are at least two days per week, but preferably three, they should be non-consecutive. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Saturday. Um, there are a number of different ways to do resistance training. There is no one perfect way. Over the years, I've, I've heard many people argue about what's the best way to resistance train. But in general, if, if it's easier, you should do more repetitions. If it's harder, you can get by with fewer repetitions. The sets can vary. Uh, two to three sets per exercise is usually what's recommended, but gains can be made from even one set per exercise. I myself get kind of bored doing the same ones, uh, three sets of the same thing, so I'll do different activities that target the same muscle groups and maybe only do one to two sets instead. Um, but in general, minimum of eight to 10 exercises for the large muscle groups of the upper body, lower body, and core. There are a number of different things that people can use now. The most trendy one is using your own body weight as resistance, but you can see here some equipment that gives you options to, to do free weights and uh, resistance bands and so forth. Uh, basically, the way that we usually progress with this is increasing resistance until we hit a certain number of repetitions or a certain number of sets, and then increasing maybe the total number of sets and the frequency last, although again, that can vary. With flexibility, this is recommended at least two to three days per week uh, or after any time someone does some other type of, aer of aerobic or resistance training. It's usually better to warm up muscles first, um, include all the major muscle groups that um, are being used or have been used. It can be done both statically or dynamically. So statically is the traditional kind of stretching, whereas dynamic is kind of stretching with movement. Uh, and as I mentioned, this is really, really critical with aging, uh, both aging and diabetes uh, that accelerates kind of the how, how much flexibility that we're lo losing over time. And we want to try to combat that however we can. Balance training is definitely recommended for anyone over 40, but uh, for some people with diabetes, they may need to start even sooner than that. Uh, at least two to three days a week, but daily is even better. Um, older adults may need to practice longer to get the same benefits. Some of the training that we do for resistance that in includes both the lower body and the core can also double as balance training, but you can also do using a bunch of different types of equipment, uh, balance exercises, uh, different standing on different surfaces, surfaces, doing different 
kinds of activities like Tai Chi, Qigong, yoga, practice standing on one leg. And there's so many different things that can be done, but it is very important to help prevent falls. We know that um, falls, falling is, is one of the major risk factors for older adults, but particularly older adults with diabetes and particularly those with any kind of uh, loss of sensation in their feet from peripheral neuropathy. As you can see, the balance training also can include aspects of neuromotor training for functional fitness. We work on agility or coordination. Uh, with people with neuropathy, their gait can change. Uh, we can have changes in proprioception that we can try to better with proprioceptive type exercises. We can also do a number of simple balance exercises. The most simple is just practicing standing on one leg at a time, like a stork. Uh, but you can see a whole list of things here. Some are illustrated, like just practicing increasing the strength of the toes in the foot. That's something we may not think about, but that's really important for balance ability, um, standing uh, on cushions, sitting to standing, which is uh, important for people being to, able to get up out of chairs and, and so forth. Also, many studies have looked at combinations of training. They haven't always controlled for calories, but when they have controlled for the total calorie expenditure and doing both aerobic and resistance, they found that that actually is very good in terms of blood glucose management in people with diabetes or even pre-diabetes. Uh, I don't know that it really matters if all the activities are done on the same days or different days of the week. Um, I mean, I personally like to mix things up and do a variety of activities. So some days I do one activity and another day I do a different activity. So you get the benefits of all those types of, of activities. And again, the, some of these combined yoga, Tai Chi things work on so many aspects at the same time of, of fitness that are important in people with type two diabetes. But most of all, enjoyable activities are what you should pick because that's when it's gonna be, people are gonna stay motivated to be active and they're gonna be more likely to participate. Speaking about progression, as I mentioned, this, this de it depends on a number of things. Uh, age is, by itself isn't a determinant as much as how active someone is, what their real goals are in terms of their, their activities that they're gonna undertake. And if they have any physical limitations or health problems that, that may be worsened by doing a particular activity. So one of the things that does work best is cross training. So doing a, a variety of activities on different days so that there isn't a, a rep repetitive stress of the same type day after day. For most individuals, it's very prudent to err on the side of caution when progressing. So starting out slowly, progressing slowly. Usually this is not a, a race to the end. This is a, just a, a, law, a goal to become active and remain active throughout life. And this can be best accomplished by preventing injuries by not starting out too rapidly et cetera, or getting demotivated. In terms of daily movement and activity breaks, we now know that just uh, breaking up sedentary time is very important. Getting more daily movement, uh, I like to call it spa time. So if spa means spontaneous physical activity, that means people just should get up and stand and walk around, take more steps, may not get the same kind of benefits in terms of fitness, but they still do get health benefits. Uh, we do know that breaking up sedentary time uh, actually changes metabolism, and that can be very important in both uh, in terms of managing diabetes and preventing uh, problems uh, down the line, um, maybe lowering insulin resistance, um, preventing some of uh, the underlying inflammation. So even interrupting sitting with light to moderate activity of any kind is very, uh, seems to be a very effective but it should probably be at least every 30 minutes or so. There are many ways to just get in more daily spa time. Um, as you can see, this is a list of, of suggestions. You've probably seen most of these at some point, but sometimes getting a dog that you have to take for a walk regularly can be very effective or just taking time out to spend time with your family, uh, just getting up and walking around more often. We're doing those planned activity breaks. Just wanna mention a few other things that are really important. Um, barriers, I mean, I think that most people understand that physical activity is good for them. So then it comes to the point of trying to decipher why 
people aren't motivated to, to do more. They know, probably know what they should be doing. Why aren't they doing it? Oftentimes it's because there are some barriers or some obstacles that stand in the way. We know the most common ones in people in general are um, perceived lack of time, lack of motivation, perhaps in not having accessibility to places to be active, or maybe it's not convenient, or they get injuries related to being active. And it's, it's very important that you address, find out what these are, um, and then help them address them and make SMART goals, which are basically very specific goals. So instead of saying, um, I'm gonna be more active, you wanna say, I'm gonna exercise for 15 minutes at lunchtime on Monday, Wednesday, Friday this week. That's a SMART goal because it's very attainable, realistic, it's measurable, it's time limited uh, and very specific. So other barriers in particular with people with diabetes are uh, fear of hypoglycemia, particularly in anyone who uses insulin, which could be a pretty significant number of people who have type two diabetes take supplemental insulin, but also anyone who uses certain uh, oral diabetes medications that cause the body to release insulin. And you can see some of them are listed here. Those in particular can cause bouts of uh, events, hypoglycemic events that people then don't want to exercise because that happens to them, in which case they really need to talk with their medical provider about maybe lowering the doses of those medications to prevent hypoglycemia. The good news is most of the diabetes medications that people use for type 2 diabetes management do not have any impact on uh, how the body responds, responds to, blood uh, to physical activity in terms of blood glucose don't cause hypoglycemia. Metformin, which is the most commonly used one, does not cause hypoglycemia with exercise. A lot of the newer ones um, that uh, target the, the gut hormones do not cause hypoglycemia. So th this is all good news. I also want to mention that there are now a, a number of digital health app uh, applications that are available for training. Um, and there are many different ways to do this. Uh, there are online programs to, to both track and monitor. There are mobile apps that be, can be used. I, I personally use one that's called Mount My Walk because sometimes I just like to know the distance that I travel or cycle and I'm able to turn it on and, and see how far I've gone and, the uh, amount of time that it took me to, to, co to cover that, that distance. But it's also good in terms of um, uh, supervision, like if you can do it in a group with other people, I mean, so people know what you're doing, um, it's gonna be very motivating and it's a good way to monitor what you're doing. Some of the apps um, are available for, for example, the one shown here through Technogym, but also you can use ones that are diabetes specific. And some of those actually allow you to monitor blood glucose simultaneously. There are actually some interesting things now, like with an, an Apple Watch, where if you use a, a Dexcom continuous glucose monitor, you can actually have that displayed on your Apple Watch. So when you're out exercising, you can actually see what your blood glucose is doing, and that helps help prevent highs and, and lows. But in general, I think um, monitoring, at least initially when people get started, is very motivating and, and very helpful in terms of people learning how their body responds, how much they should be doing, and everything that may be recommended along those lines. And finally, I just wanted to briefly talk about health complications because most of the people I do know with type 2 diabetes have comorbidities. And I have yet to find a, a health complication, um, maybe other than um, uh, quadriplegia, that would, would disallow people from finding some physical activity that they can undertake. Um, but, but there are pre uh, precautions and or recommendations given these different problems. So a lot of people that have overweight or obese, uh, are obese um, have type 2 diabetes may have arthritis in their joints or certain joint limitations. And so again, programs have to be picked and, and chosen around what those limitations are. Many people with type two diabetes also have 
uh, plaque formation, heart disease, or peripheral artery disease, um, and that needs to be taken into account. Luckily now, we know that it's very safe for most people with any type of, of coronary artery blockage to undertake physical activity, particularly resistance training. But again, it still needs to be done safely, perhaps with monitoring and supervision. Um, hypertension, again, needs to be taken under occasion with precautions. Um, I bolded peripheral neuropathy here because I mentioned that is the most common um, complication associated with type 2 diabetes. And in those cases, again, balance training is very important, but also monitoring the feed and making sure that uh, people are not causing injuries that are going undetected that can result in ulcers that could potentially result in uh, pictures like this where partial amputations and so forth. Again, those, those can be prevented in many cases, but it requires monitoring and some uh, changes in terms of what types of activities that people are, are doing and what's recommendation, recommended. Um, again, these other ones like uh, central autonomic uh, or autonomic neuropathy or even um, eye diseases, it doesn't mean that people can't exercise, but oftentimes they have to take certain precautions. I could spend 30 minutes just talking about all the specifics for each one of those. I'm just going to leave it to say that that information is available out there, particularly in some of the position statements that we've done for ACSM and, and I've done for the American Diabetes Association. That information is available. So sort of summarizing here, what should everyone be doing? Getting moving more, obviously working on staying strong, getting more flexible, practicing balancing, moving more all day long, spontaneous activity, breaking up sedentary time, and just remembering to get some physical activity every day. That is very important to health, whether you have diabetes or not. So in conclusion, I think it's pretty, clear now that both type 2 diabetes and prediabetes, which are characterized by insulin resistance, may be uh, prevented or reduced, the risk of the reduced with lifestyle changes that include physical activity. Very important. Um, we know we can prevent it with the studies. We know that we can at least delay the onset uh, in many cases. Um, and though, although making those lifestyle changes can lead to weight loss, I think that the more important part for weight maintenance is physical activity after weight loss. And that helps improve insulin action, which is always a benefit when you're trying to manage the glucose levels. Another good news item was that those people who start out with the lowest levels of activity have the most to gain by becoming active. And they can gain a lot by doing very little, which is really good news for people who want to, to start doing something and may feel like it's already too late. It's not too late. Um, regularly doing a variety of activities is good for management of diabetes and, and even prediabetes and prevention of onset of type two. And again, include a variety of activities, all the four types, uh, aerobic resistance, flexibility, balance training for anybody over 40, more daily movement and activity breaks. With that, I thank you, and I'm happy to take your questions as soon as we're ready.